let me present for you the autonomic nervous system. Hopefully you have some knowledge of it from normal anatomy, but now you may have clear idea about both its structure and function. It is due to this system that we have constant support of our activities and we do not have to think how to arrange it to activate digestive secretion and peristalsis after meal, how to provide increase of blood supply to muscles during physical activity, provide higher cardiac output and oxygen delivery. All this goes automatically by the activity of autonomic nervous system and it saves us from necessity to arrange all this consciously and makes us free to do something different we prefer to do, to concentrate on our higher nervous function. So that's its activity of the autonomic nervous system, and it's really autonomic. Now let's consider the <coughs> autonomic nervous system structural features. First, there is a simple definition that it is a set of efferent pathways that come from central nervous system and innervate the following organs, smooth muscles predominantly, cardiac muscle and glands. First, let's compare it to the somatic nervous system efferent pathways. They begin from the motor neurons, in particular alpha motor neurons predominantly of ventral horns, and their axons go directly without interruptions to the effector organs. And C, autonomic nervous system neurons, efferent neurons, have not only one. First neuron is located in the spinal cord and its axon goes to autonomic ganglion. And <coughs> therefore this first axon is called preganglionic fiber. Then second neuron from ganglion sends its postganglionic fiber to effector organs. When for somatic system effector organs are skeletal muscles, for autonomic system we have first neuron which does not reach the effector, just comes to ganglion, and second ganglionic or in, it's often called postganglionic neuron itself while it's located in ganglion. It <coughs> sends axon to the effector organs, which are smooth muscles, cardiac muscle, glands, or sometimes gastrointestinal neurons. Let's start to consider anatomy, which I hope you have some knowledge again. The parasympathetic centers are called, in short, craniosacral. If you remember this name, craniosacral, you already know a piece of information that part of centers are cranial, and part are sacral. As for cranial, that includes, it includes midbrain and hindbrain centers. And sacral centers are limited by the three segments of the sacral portion of the spinal cord, S2, 3, and 4. And between them we have the sympathetic centers. Sympathetic centers also, in short, can be called thoracolumbar. And it's also a very helpful name, thoracolumbar. It's shown that exactly in these segments we have the centers of the sympathetic system. But you may notice that not all of them. As for thoracic segments, they all, all 12 are included into sympathetic centers and all they contain the sympathetic neurons. As for lumbar portion, only two first. In some cases, in some people, it can be also L3 included, but usually L1, L2. So, thoraca lumbar centers. And as sympathetic ganglia are located very close to the spinal cord, most of them, they form the chain, and really in reality, two chains on both sides of the spinal cord. And this chain of thoraca lumbar ganglia form the so called sympathetic trunk. So actually two trunks are located on both sides of the spinal cord and this trunk is created by the chain of um, ganglia, like this, that come from one to the next segment and they contain the bodies of the second ganglionic or you may say postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system. Let's recall again the two main divisions. First, maybe you should notice that not all the segments have the autonomic neurons, not everywhere. 
in the brain, lower centers are present only in the midbrain and hindbrain. And just four pairs of the cranial nerves contain fibers that belong to the parasympathetic system only. And from midbrain, this pair is the oculomotor nerve number three. Then from hindbrain, we have the three of these cranial nerves, number seven, nine, and ten. And these nerves have full, fully a parasympathetic or contain some parasympathetic fibers. Then you can see that <coughs> not the whole spinal cord has neurons that belong to autonomic system. In particular, the cervical portion does not contain autonomic neurons. As well, last lumbar and first sacral segment and the last sacral segment, there are no autonomic neurons. Therefore, there is first big structural difference from the somatic system. Somatic system neurons are present in each segment of the spinal cord, each segment. Here we don't have full uh, segment covering by autonomic neurons. Then spinal cord S2 has four segments already mentioned. Beneath also, also parasympathetic center. Again, I remind you, cranial, sacral, two cranial sources, midbrain and hindbrain, and three segments of sacral portion, middle and three portions. And sympathetic. Sympathetic division goes without interruptions from T1, the thoracic first, until the last thoracic, and then first two lumbar segments. Without interruptions, they go from T1 till L2, or sometimes L3, all the sympathetic division of the spinal cord. These centers are considered really lower centers. Then, let's compare the reflex arches of the two types, somatic and autonomic. Let's begin from the first sensory neuron. And here, there is no big difference. Both neurons, sensory neurons of these reflex arches, are located in the spinal ganglia, with one branch going from periphery, from receptor themselves, and the central branch goes into the spinal cord. Just difference uh, is receptors. The receptors of the somatic system of mostly are skin receptors, while the autonomic reflexes uh, have receptors mostly located somewhere in the internal organs. But um, diff difference of the structure is not present. Then interneurons, usually, which are present in most reflex arches of the somatic system and also in the autonomic. Interneurons also do not make great difference, they are located inside of gray matter and just produce the connection of the sensory neuron with mm, final effector or motor. But then finally we have big difference. For the somatic system, first neuron is the last neuron. This is a motor neuron that has axon going directly to the muscle and impulses come directly to muscle fibers. But for autonomic system, first neuron is located in the lateral horns, in difference from ventral horns of somatic. And from lateral horns, the axons go at first in, through the same ventral roots through which the somatic fibers pass, but then they make turn and come to the autonomic ganglion. This is, of course, case of sympathetic system where ganglia are located very close to the spinal cord. But anyway, interruption in ganglia uh, always is present, or almost always. And from autonomic ganglia, we have the second neuron, postganglionic neuron or postganglionic fibers, and these fibers finally send impulses to the effector. In this particular case, it's a smooth muscle. But as you may remember, also it can be cardiac muscle or glands. So again, difference. Effector portion of the reflex arc is uh, presented by two neurons in autonomic system with interruptions inside of the autonomic ganglion. And also the first neurons of spinal cord location is different from somatic neurons. Somatic neurons are located in the ventral horns and autonomic neurons located in the lateral horns. And these lateral horns are actually easily visible in, in the cross section of the spinal cord in the areas where we have the autonomic centers. 
Let's now consider more detail location of ganglia. Schematically, you can see here the spinal cord and you can see the to the right side effectors and ganglia location. Let's observe first for parasympathetic system. These cranial centers, midbrain and hindbrain, and sacral beneath. In both cases, generally it's the same long preganglionic fibers because in the parasympathetic system ganglia are located most often inside the walls of organ effector. Inside the walls we have also a specific term intramural, intramural, which is exactly translated as inside walls. And correspondingly, you may understand that preganglionic fibers should come from the brain or spinal cord directly to the internal organ, which is innervated. So preganglionic fibers are really long, reaching the effector. And within the effector, from ganglion distance until the innervated uh, structures is very short, usually no more than millimeters. And these are short postganglionic fibers short postganglionic fibers. Then, sympathetic system oppositely has short preganglionic fibers because ganglia are located close to the spinal cord. Remember, they form by uh, most of the most common paravertebral nearby spinal cord ganglia. We have the sympathetic trunk and ganglia are very close just after um, going out from the spinal cord, ganglion is located. So preganglionic fibers are short and correspondingly the postganglionic fibers must be long because they should reach the effector organ starting from the ganglion. So most of ganglia are close to the spinal cord, nearby the vertebra from both sides around, so it can be said paravertebral. But also there is a group of much less ganglia which are located not so close to the spinal cord. Um, not very close to the effector as well, so maybe halfway, but they are called pre-vertebral or collateral ganglia. These are paravertebral, most common, and these are collateral ganglia, located a little bit more distant from the spinal cord. And also we have one <coughs> exclusion, innervation of the adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla cells, endocrine cells, are controlled by sympathetic nerves and these sympathetic fibers <coughs> are preganglionic fibers and they come from the lateral horns of spinal cord and these fibers come directly to the cells of adrenal medulla and innervate them and make them to release the hormones into blood. Hormones include epinephrine, adrenaline and norepinephrine or noradrenaline. So we don't have second neuron here, just instead of it the cells release into blood the same substances or at least norepinephrine is the same that is normally released from the ending of the postganglionic fibers. But here we don't have postganglionic fibers and so the effector cells of adrenal medulla have innervation by only one neuron. And simply they themselves, these cells of adrenal medulla, make something like instead of postganglionic fibers. When hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, come to circulation, they can produce numerous effects around the body because they bind to the same receptors where naturally norepinephrine released from synaptic nerve ending may bind and produce corresponding effects. So this is an exclusion, just one neuron to the effector. Then on the same picture we can consider neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. We have actually four cases of transmitter release because we have preganglionic fibers transmitter and postganglionic for parasympathetic and similarly two cases pre and postganglionic transmitters for sympathetic system. So four cases. Let's see. First case parasympathetic fibers, preganglionic fibers, release acetylcholine. And similarly in sacral portion, the same. But exactly the same acetylcholine is released also in preganglionic sympathetic fibers, in all cases, including the exclusion of adrenal medulla. So actually, you may notice that all neurons that release a transmitter, that send 
axons out from the spinal cord, they all release acetylcholine. This is for a whole autonomic nervous system. But if you recall the somatic neurons, alpha motor neurons, they also finally release acetylcholine. So it's easy to remember and understand that all exits from the spinal cord and from the central nervous system are cholinergic. They all release acetylcholine, no exclusions. All. Then, postganglionic fibers, and they are transmitter. For parasympathetic system, transmitter is again the same, acetylcholine. And in the sacral portion, similarly. So, the one and the same transmitter is used in both pre- and postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nerves. Just different receptors they stimulate, but transmitter is one and the same. So, out of the four cases, we have three times acetylcholine. And taking into account that somatic system also releases the same transmitter, we can conclude that most widespread transmitter in the whole body is acetylcholine. But now, finally, sympathetic postganglionic fibers do have difference and they release norepinephrine in most cases, with some exclusions which we consider later. And here in collateral ganglia, of course, the same. And actually, cells of adrenal medulla produce similarly norepinephrine, but epinephrine as well, like all catecholamines. So, this all one and the same group, at least, of substances. So, again, let's re uh, repeat transmitters and receptors types. So, parasympathetic long preganglionic fibers and sympathetic. In all preganglionic fibers, there is acetylcholine transmitter. And receptors are, it's important, nicotinic. N2 receptors, they indicated with, more, with uh, number 2, because N1 are nicotinic cholinergic receptors in the post-synaptic membrane of the neuromuscular junction, synapse between nerve and muscle in the somatic system. So N2, both receptors are nicotinic. They both designed for acetylcholine, both can respond to nicotine, which is not physiological action, but they are not exactly the same. Some substances, like maybe you remember about the neuromuscular junction postsynaptic receptor inhibitor blocker curare, it blocks only neuromuscular junction nicotinic receptors of N1 type. Also, we have a number of substances that considered in pharmacology as ganglial blockers. They are able to block N2 receptors in the autonomic ganglia but they don't influence the receptors in the neuromuscular junction. So N1 receptors, they do not uh, block. Therefore, they are slightly different, but they both are nicotinic and both, of course, cholinergic receptors. Now, finally, acetylcholine is released from parasympathetic postganglionic fibers, but here acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors, another type of acetylcholine receptors. Just to differentiate from nicotinic, they are called muscarinic, but they designed, of course, for acetylcholine. These receptors are 70 ms membrane, uh, seven, uh, transmembrane segment receptors family, and this receptor operates through G proteins and correspondingly through um, formation of second messengers. And sympathetic system releases norepinephrine in most cases. And for norepinephrine or noradrenaline, maybe it's uh, in both cases possible, noradrenaline, norepinephrine, but receptors are called adrenergic. So maybe noradrenaline is better for clear understanding that. Adrenergic receptors are for noradrenaline. And we have many subtypes of receptors for noradrenaline, and they generally first uh, are divided into alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. And they may provide very different effects depending on type or subtype of receptor. So now let's sum it all up by a very simple scheme, which actually can be easily copied from the screen by your own drawing in time, according to the lecture. It makes it much easier to memorize all this, but it's up to you. You may look at it, this, you may draw yourself this scheme, which is easily copied. This <coughs> Uh, figure will represent the spinal cord with a uh, portion of the brain. And here we can have divisions. 
This will be the midbrain portion with an ocular motor number three nerve. This will be the hindbrain division with the facial <coughs> and other nerves seven, nine, and ten. Then we should make interruption because the cervical portion does not contain autonomic neurons. And here it will be thoraca lumbar. Here no interruption, but let's divide thoracic portion of spinal cord and lumbar portion. And then again interruption because few lumbar segments and first sacral segment do, they do not contain the autonomic neurons. So with this interruption we may place here the sacral segments. And now we have all segments for the autonomic nervous system, cranial and sacral for parasympathetic shown in blue and also the red uh, shown in red thoracal lumbar segments. Then to the right side we will draw the axons. First neuron, uh, neurons are preganglionic and they are long preganglionic fibers for parasympathetic system. And they all release acetylcholine, let it be abbreviation, and they bind, acetylcholine released here binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors of N2 type. Similarly in sacral portion, the same, it's craniosacral parasympathetic centers. Now, ganglionic neurons or postganglionic, shorter, and they release as again acetylcholine, but now it binds to the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And similarly in sacral portion. So, muscarinic receptors. So, this picture shows the length of the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers relatively compared, sh shows which transmitters are released from all the fibers and which receptors this transmitter binds to. Now, sympathetic system. First, most widespread case when preganglionic fibers are short, very short. They release the same transmitter as all other preganglionic fibers, including parasympathetic, and it binds again to N2, nicotinic cholinergic receptors, and these neurons send their long postganglionic fibers to the effector. And there they release norepinephrine. And norepinephrine binds to both alpha or beta receptors. And it, this binding depends on domination of receptors in each organ. In some organs we have mostly one type of receptors, in other organs mostly another type of receptors. So, but norepinephrine can bind to both of them. Now let's show here are the exclusion. This triangle is schematical representation of the adrenal glands, which are in the cross section, not so sharply angled, but angled. And the neurons that innervate this um, innervates only medulla cells because cortex is controlled by other mechanisms, as you remember, by adrenocorticotropic hormone and also by renin angiotensin aldosterone system as for superficial layer which is glomerulus layer producing aldosterone. And here we have similarly release of acetylcholine and receptors are again nicotinic and two receptors. And as a result, the cells, endocrine cells of medulla, secret into blood hormones, pre predominantly epinephrine, about 80%, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, about 20%. And this hormone may circulate in blood and can additionally provide uh, support of the effect of norepinephrine secreted from nerve endings, because these hormones can bind to all these receptors also. And so, usually, effect of activation of the sympathetic system is always um, more or less supported by endocrine support from adrenal medulla and release of hormones, which are catecholamines. Sometimes all, also they can be called the fluid sympathetic system, and it's really uh, the synergist of the sympathetic system. Then, just I want to add one thing comparison with the somatic system. Somatic system, motor neurons located in the ventral horns, send the axon directly without any interruptions to the skeletal muscles, the effectors, and release acetylcholine that binds to the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, but in different contrast to the nicotinic N2 receptors of autonomic ganglia, these nicotinic cholinergic receptors are N1. 
different, slightly different from N2 receptors. So now on one, this uh, simple picture, you have combination of, again, the lens of pre- and post-ganglionic fibers relative comparison. You have indication of type of receptors and you have indication of neurotransmitters and also certain uh, exclusion as uh, you can see adrenal medulla which is generated differently than most of other organs by the autonomic nervous system. As for ganglion in, in sympathetic system paravertebral or prevertebral there is no difference in release of transmitter and no difference of uh, receptors. Therefore, I don't show specifically separately. Just location of ganglia is not as close to spinal cord as uh, for usual paravertebral ganglia that form the sympathetic trunk. Now, the effects of autonomic system on body organs and functions. This is something that should be remembered as a table of multiplication. It's not very complex, but maybe from the first attempt it looks not so easy. But let's first then general, make general observation. Look how many internal organs are innervated by the um, autonomic nervous system as a whole. Let's see. The eye. Of course, in the eye, what is innervated by autonomic system? The pupilla dilation or constriction by muscle sphincter dilator and also ciliary muscle can change the um, lens uh, degree of uh, light refraction. Then lacrimal mucus glands secretion is controlled by autonomic system. Salivary glands are controlled. Then the lungs and bronchi. Bronchial wall contains the smooth muscles that can be contracted more or less. And the heart is innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which provide opposite effects. The liver and gallbladder, the formation of the bile, is controlled by the autonomic system. Spleen, stomach, pancreas, all these <coughs> functions can control to the functions of these organs controlled by autonomic system. Then adrenal gland and kidney. But an adrenal gland, I hope you remember that this predominantly this is medulla. Then large and small intestine, many processes are controlled by autonomic system. Then urinary bladder, reproductive organ. You see how big is the list of uh, organs which are controlled by autonomic nervous system. And for these organs effects, we should remember which effects are produced by activation of the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. But before, let's Consider the general principle, mostly, not always, but mostly, action of sympathetic and parasympathetic system, uh, actions are opposite to each other. And, of course, it's because of difference in transmitters. Let's recall, final transmitter, we now consider only final one, not intermediate. Parasympathetic transmitter is acetylcholine, while sympathetic is norepinephrine in most cases. And again, I remind you that it's so easy that mistake in this can be considered a very, very bad mistake. Acetylcholine is released equally in all preganglionic fibers intermediately. So I didn't even indicate now which is sympathetic or parasympathetic. But final transmitter is different. If this is a parasympathetic system, final transmitter is acetylcholine again. If it's sympathetic, and again this is the only one case of difference, there is no epinephrine. So out of the four cases, only one case is different. This is postganglionic sympathetic fibers, which in particular, maybe you remember, belong to the type C, that are non-myelinated, with smallest diameter, smallest velocity of impulses conduction, but these fibers finally release no epinephrine. So the sympathetic transmitter is no epinephrine, one of catecholamines. But there are some exclusions, no, no, but generally you should remember this, nor epinephrine. And parasympathetic is acetylcholine. Let's also recall the type of innervation, how this innervation occurs, because the synapses are different from the somatic system, autonomic synapses. Here you have uh, an example of the most widespread, most uh, often um, 
the effector, which is smooth muscle, and most uh, usual sin single unit smooth muscles, where all muscle fibers are connected by gap junctions. And autonomic neuron passes nearby, and on its way, it produces the varicosities. And when impulse is generated by autonomic neuron, this impulse goes through the whole axon, and each varicosity begins release of transmitter. Each varicosity contains the vesicles with transmitter, and by activation through action potential, as usual, uh, calcium entry is necessary to activate process of exocytosis, and transmitter is released. And you see there is no particular contact with the cells, just it's released immediately uh, nearby the cells, and the nearest cells get this transmitter, and then they uh, become excited and give the excitation from one cell to next through gap junctions. And these synapses that uh, are formed on the way of axon exactly are called, uh, in French it means exactly synapses on their way, on the way, synapses en passant. So these synapses, um, synapses produce the release of transmitter when autonomic neurons sense impulses. And so not all the cells receive this transmitter, but all the cells become excited because of gap junctions which connect membrane, on the, if you remember, the full connection of the cell interior, therefore <coughs> change of potential of the membrane easily is conducted from cell to cell. And also it's important that many, many effector cells and of course small muscles are innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic system as well. And due to this double innervation, the cells may be contracted or relaxed dependent on which cells, because sometimes sympathetic system may produce contraction, sometimes relaxation, and correspondingly parasympathetic may produce both effects. In most cases, these effects between sympathetic and parasympathetic system are opposite. But you never can say that sympathetic system produces one particular reaction, constriction, even contraction of cells or relaxation. It depends on receptor type and depends on organ. So, but mostly res uh, these effects of two divisions of the autonomic system are antagonistic. Sympathetic norepinephrine, parasympathetic acetylcholine. And effects, as a rule, are opposite to each other. So, and therefore we can control organs and produce any effect we need. Let's recall also that parasympathetic system is represented by three, four cranial nerves and also sacral nerves. But number one parasympathetic for parasympathetic system is the nervous vagus nerve, number 10. Actually, it's uh, considered to be to make about three quarters of the whole parasympathetic system, at least three quarters, or 75%. Parasympathetic effects on the most internal organs really occur through vagus nerve. Look, nerve number 10, comes and innervates so many structures. Not, not surprisingly that it's called vagus, wandering, wandering through the whole body between organs and innervating these organs, nerve, and plus sacral portion. So, and sympathetic effects performed by sympathetic nerves from paravertebral ganglia and from prevertebral. Paravertebral are located from T1 to L2 or so as chain of ganglia, which are located against each segment, so it forms the sympathetic trunk. Two of them, as I said, from both sides of the spinal cord. But also there are few of the prevertebral or collateral ganglia. The ciliac ganglion, then superior mesenteric ganglion, and inferior mesenteric ganglion. Also, there are few not shown here, like hypogastric and so, but main are shown here. Before consideration of particular effects for each organ or system of autonomic nervous system, let's make again it clear what is the general purpose of the autonomic nervous system activity. There is division of function between divisions. Parasympathetic system, predominantly, provides 
energy and nutrients accumulation. And when they accumulate, they can be stored until when necessary. Itself, parasympathetic system provides only resting level of activity of many organs and systems. Therefore, at rest, we don't need high activity of the cardiac system or cardiovascular or respiratory because resting requirement in oxygen is not so great. And so the parasympathetic system contributes to lower to minimal necessary level of many indices of cardiovascular and respiratory system. And the system that provides energy nutrients accumulation is a digestive system. And exactly this system is highly active when parasympathetic system controls the body. So if we need to express the um, all purposes of the parasympathetic system activation, in short, it can be expressed by the slogan rest and digest. So, and the sympathetic system is opposite. Exactly all that stored, accumulated and stored by parasympathetic system for moment when it's necessary, exactly is used when this moment comes and when moment of necessity to spend energy comes, this is moment of sympathetic system activity. It provides increased level of physical activity and it stimulates everything that necessary for activity to get energy. It stimulates the respiratory system to get more oxygen into blood. It stimulates cardiovascular system to provide high amount of blood to pass through the cycle and to bring more oxygen to tissues. And generally it stimulates loss of this accumulated nutrients, expenditure, usage and energy usage. So usually it becomes active uh, and moment of physical activity, but emotional stress similarly produces activation of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Its slogan sounds like fight or flight. In case of any increased uh, requirement to the um, <coughs> body, we have to decide, and it's for ancient times, it's necessary to fight something or try to escape, which, but fly running also requires high physical activity in both cases. So sympathetic system provides this, as well as provides the high velocity of um, decision making, which means that central nervous system must be active, not only muscles. But we'll consider all the effects in detail right now. So rest and digest, fight or flight helps easily remember the general purposes of the autonomic nervous system division's activity. Now let's switch finally to the physiological effects, which is at least half of the material for the lecture. And these effects are necessary to remember well enough, and in most cases with receptors, but at least for the beginning most cases. So let's begin from the eye. Again, what is generated here? The iris muscle and ciliary muscle, smooth muscles, but mostly we consider now pupil of the eye, which depends on the iris muscle activity. Iris contains two oppositely directed fibers composing two muscles, sphincter pupilla and dilator pupilla. Radial fibers may dilate pupilla, while uh, circular fibers contraction makes narrow, small pupilla. And parasympathetic effect is contraction of the circular muscle of iris through parasympathetic fibers in the ocular motor nerve. And it results in constriction of pupil, or it's called by Greek term meiosis. Observe this meiosis change. <coughs> you see narrowing of pupil. Also, when this is a result of higher light action on the eye, it's a pupil reflex, narrowing of the eye or meiosis under light stimulation. Receptors here are muscarinic cholinergic receptors of M3 subtypes. Generally, these numbers are not of greatest importance, but it's very easy to memorize. Mostly we consider just two types, M3 and M2. All receptors are muscarinic, M, because they all are cholinergic and respond to acetylcholine. But in most cases we use the M3 receptors and they always are involved when this is smooth muscle. In the smooth muscle, if you remember from the, the chemical signaling, activation of contraction in most cases is achieved by activation of G protein, GQ, which stimulates increases activity of phospholipase C 
and this uh, enzyme produces IP3 inositol triphosphate and DAG diacylglycerol 2 second messengers, which contribute to contraction of the smooth muscle. At least you can remember that IP3 opens calcium channels from reticulum and calcium is released into cytoplasm, binds to calmodulin, and all this results in finally activation of smooth muscle contraction through IP3. So this is receptor of M3 type. So in all cases, when we consider effect of smooth muscle contraction due to parasympathetic stimulation, it's always achieved through M3 cholinergic receptor. So you may not memorize number, but you logically always can say if it's contraction of smooth muscle in the parasympathetic effect, this is through M3 cholinergic receptor. If you see that effect is not um, related to smooth muscle contraction, you may say this is M2 cholinergic receptor. This is for simple memorizing. So second messenger is IP3 and diacylglycerol. Then look at the picture. Midbrain, cranial nerve number three, oculomotor, contains of course the um, stimulation uh, fibers that stimulate the contraction of oculomotor um, muscles which are striated muscles, so it's somatic fibers they are, but there is also parasympathetic fiber. And you see it goes through ciliary ganglion where the second neuron is located, and this second neuron finally comes to the circular muscle of iris. And muscle is contracted and pupil becomes constricted. Opposite effect is produced by sympathetic system. And you may remember, I don't know in English such an expression, but in Russian we always say that fear makes great big eyes. And here again, sympathetic effects, sympathetic system is activated in case of fever as any other strong emotions. And it results in dilation of pupilla. For this, <coughs> the other radial muscle might be contracted, dilator, musculus dilator of pupilla. And as a result, we have, it goes from sympathetic ganglion, there's already second neuron, and passes through ciliary ganglion without interruption directly to the smooth muscle, radial muscle of iris, and produces dilation of pupilla. In Latin or from Greek term, it's called midriasis, or maybe it's a midriasis. Look again, this is dilation of pupilla. Naturally, it occurs in case of uh, decreased light, but sympathetic system may produce it at any moment. And receptor here is alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. It would be easier to remember which, which time we have alpha-1 or others. <coughs> Again, if alpha-1 is uh, involved, it always refers to the smooth muscle again. Like if uh, parasympathetic system provides contraction of smooth muscle, it goes definitely through M3 cholinergic receptors. And also, simil similarly, if sympathetic system provides smooth muscle contraction, it goes through alpha-1 receptor, because this receptor also activates phospholipase C, and second messengers are again IP3 and diacylglycerol. You see, effects are opposite, but achieved through the same mechanism, actually. And why the same? Because in both cases, this is contraction of the smooth muscle. Just different direction of fibers produces opposite effect. Now, salivary and lacrimal glands. Parasympathetic effects is, for salivary glands, increased secretion of the thin saliva. Let's observe. Through facial nerve, we stimulate lacrimal gland secretion and also sublingual and submandibular salivary glands. Through the number 9 nerve, glossopharyngeal, we stimulate the parotid salivary gland. And all these nerves, their parasympathetic fibers, stimulate the secretion. And secretion becomes faster and a high amount is formed. And if we talk about salivation, this saliva becomes thin, watery, fluid, very much fluid. Because actually it's very fast production of saliva, there is no enough time to add some more mucin and other proteins that make it more viscous. 
and contains much more uh, simply water. So this becomes thin but high amount, which is exactly necessary when we start to swallow, uh, start to chew and swallow uh, food pieces. And it's important to dilute with uh, much more watery uh, saliva and to, to make it easy to swallow. Sympathetic effect. Secretion of the thick saliva in little amount. So, achieved due to activation of the sympathetic nerves from superior thoracic ganglia. So, they come to the same ones but produce different effects. And here it's necessary to notice that it's slightly different from regular antagonistic effects. In most other cases of secretion and digestive secretion, we have purely opposite effects, stimulation and inhibition. As for salivation, there is no pure antagonistic, uh, pure opposite effect, because uh, actually it's designed in for constant presence of saliva. We never should have entirely dry mouth because saliva has many functions and not only function of uh, um, contribution to swallowing uh, is uh, um, for, <coughs> for sal saliva. Also it should be present in rest and state but in much smaller amount. It produces its protective effects for the oral cavity mucosa and so on. For T's function, calcium delivery and so on. Therefore there is no full inhibition normally. Excessive sympathetic stimulation, unusually strong, may produce dryness in the mouth, but naturally, when we perform even activity, or physical activity, which is accompanied by sympathetic system activation, there is no full dryness in the mouth, mouth naturally. And just it's much less, uh, much less amount of the saliva is produced, and with slow formation, it becomes much thicker, and it it's, uh, maintains normal, dry, normal moisture in the oral cavity. So here, let's re remember for future that um, parasympathetic system stimulates big amount of saliva secretion and this saliva is fluid enough, thin. But sympathetic uh, system does not suppress entirely saliva secretion and it produces secretion of small amount of very thick and viscous saliva. So it's not fully opposite, but generally it's as usual. All digestive secretion is naturally stimulated by parasympathetic system, while inhibited or decreased by sympathetic. And here it's the general tendency to have much less secretion, but not full inhibition. No, this I never say that sympathetic system inhibits the secretion of saliva. The heart. The heart is one of easy thing because everyone remembers that adrenaline stimulates the heart and adrenaline is the fluid sympathetic system. So the heart, parasympathetic effect, again if you go logically from rest and state, at rest we don't need to stimulate heart greatly. The heart may have also a rest and contract not very strongly, not with high frequency. So the effect of the parasympathetic system on the heart and in particular this parasympathetic system here is represented by vagus nerve fibers. Decrease of heart rate and decreased force of contraction. This is effect of vagus. Receptors are M2 cholinergic receptors. Let's remember that I said if it's contraction of the smooth muscle, M3 receptors. If it's something different, you may be sure that it's not M3 but M2 receptors. M2 cholinergic receptors and mechanism is suppression of CIMP formation and increased permeability for potassium. Detailed understanding of this mechanism maybe will come when we'll study the heart in detail. But even now you may understand high permeability for potassium actually always increases the loss of potassium from cell and produces hyperpolarization, which never will contribute to strong activation and contraction. Sympathetic effect. Sympathetic is opposite. Of course, if we are excited by something or perform physical activity, the heart is the key organ that provides high oxygen delivery, high cardiac output, high blood pressure, and so sympathetic effect is an increase of the heart rate in <coughs> force of contraction. And this is achieved by beta adrenergic receptors. And here it's necessary to memorize that heart contains predominantly beta-1 adrenergic receptors. 
I must say that actually each organ may contain not the only one type of receptor. And it's <clears throat> if you go deeper, <coughs> it may contain a number of. But predominant receptors must be memorized first. Then you can understand that not everything is so simple. But for beginning, let it be very simple. The heart contains predominantly beta-1 adrenergic receptors. And predominant effect is easy to predict. This is stimulation. Second messenger in this case is cyclic AMP. All beta receptors activate adenoid cyclase. But beta-1 in the heart produce effect of higher permeability of a calcium, which contributes to both higher excitability and higher force of contraction. <coughs> now, bronchial smooth muscles. Here also we can predict something, because logically at rest we don't need great amount of oxygen, therefore don't need a great you know, deep respiration, and bronchi should not be dilated strongly. While in higher activity we need to have greater air supply to lungs to get more oxygen, and so it requires wider bronchi. So you can predict that bronchial well, parasympathetic effect on bronchi is contraction of the smooth muscle, which decreases diameter, constriction of bronchi. And if it's contraction of smooth muscles, again, receptors are muscarinic cholinergic receptors of type M3. With, with second messengers, IP3 and diacylglycerol. Sympathetic effect. Relaxation of smooth muscles, which makes bronchi to be dilated with higher diameter, and it <coughs> contributes to bringing more fresh air into lungs. And receptors here are again beta receptors, like in the heart, but in different subtype, beta 2. Both beta receptors 1 and 2 operate through adenylate cyclase pathway and cyclic AMP, but in the heart it results in higher permeability for calcium and activation of the heart, higher force and rate of contraction. In the smooth muscles of bronchial wall, cyclic AMP finally brings decrease in calcium, which of course makes less degree of contraction or simply relaxation of smooth muscles. Second messenger is cyclic AMP, but result is relaxation. Smooth muscles of blood vessels. As for blood vessels, it's one of the most complex set of effects because we have great difference here. First thing, which must be remembered always, parasympathetic effect. No effect, practically. No innervation. Vessels, smooth muscles of vascular wall do not have any innervation normally from parasympathetic system. Generally, parasympathetic system may influence the few vessels, but it, this influence goes not to smooth muscles, but to endothelial cells. And these are also mm, very little exclusions, very little. First, <coughs> horda tympani, this is parasympathetic nerve, and also nervous pelvicus. These two branches of parasympathetic nerves do have an innervation of <coughs> vessels of some organs, but not an innervation of smooth muscles, of vascular endothelium. And Receptors are M3 cholinergic receptors and messenger IP3 and diacylglycerols. And it goes through release of specific substance that was, mm, before identification, was called, and now it's called also, endothelial derived relaxing factor, EDRF. And later it was identified as molecule of nitrogen oxide. And O is a simple molecule of two atoms which is highly lipid soluble and easily moves from vascular endothelial cells to the next layer of smooth muscles, where it produces an uh, effect of relaxation and vessels are dilated. But again, these are only few exclusions, endothelium of a few organs. Horda tympani, this is one branch of the facial nerve, number seven, that mm, innervates vessels of the <coughs> salivary glands. And you remember, parasympathetic effect in salivary glands is high secretion. How this high secretion can be achieved? High amount of thin saliva. All, practically all juices, digestive juices of our body, formed 
by filtration of blood. So to increase the formation of juice, it's necessary to bring much more blood to the glands that produce the juice. In our case, saliva. So how to increase salivation? By greater blood supply. And here exactly this is exclusion when the salivary glands by stimulation of this um, corda tympani have, have greater blood supply and from this great amount of blood they produce a lot of saliva which is not greatly different in composition from blood plasma no, just slightly different of course but um, it's still not very viscous and second case nervous pellivicus this refers to the generation of sex organs and the necessary enlargement that happens sometimes is the product of the dilation of vessels by stimulation of parasympathetic nerves. But these are only two exclusions and generally we have no innervation at all in all the rest vessels of our body from parasympathetic system. So we may conclude that vessels are controlled by only one sympathetic system alone. And here we have a number of different effects. Smooth muscles or blood vessels have numerous sympathetic effects and they are different in different organs. Skin and digestive organs. Here sympathetic system produces contraction of smooth muscles and constriction of vessels because receptors are alpha-1 that operate through IP3 and DIC, DIG. So, and this is because of presence of these alpha-1 receptors. Skin vessels and digestive organ vessels have decreased blood supply when sympathetic system is active. Next, vessels of the heart, coronary vessels. Here we have different effect. Relaxation of smooth muscles and dilation of vessels. And receptors are beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Again, it's not as simple and some... some other receptors also can be present. Not always it's so easy dilation, but predominantly. Predominantly relaxation and dilation. And second messenger is CAMP. And finally, skeletal muscle vessels. Here we have <coughs> different receptors. Actually, alpha-1 receptors also are present in skeletal muscle vessels. In certain number. And therefore, Theoretically, at the beginning of uh, activity, we can have constriction, but much more we have our receptors um, that belong to the type of beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which produce dilation similarly to coronary vessels. And also there is one exclusion, pay attention, M3 cholinergic receptors that operate through, um, again, in the signal derived relaxing factor and O. So, you may see, if receptors are cholinergic, it means that these fibers release acetylcholine. Only acetylcholine can bind to these receptors. So, this is exclusion. Sympathetic cholinergic fibers. In the beginning, I said that mostly sympathetic system releases noradrenaline. But there are few exclusions. And first exclusion come here, comes here. Sympathetic cholinergic fibers are present in the vessels of skeletal muscles. And these receptors also provide dilation of vessels, similarly to their regular receptors, beta-2 adrenergic. So, now how to memorize it and how to understand it? Practically, only due to distribution of receptors, the sympathetic system activation produces the so-called redistribution of blood supply. Look at this. Which vessels become dilated for the heart and for skeletal muscles? Activity of the sympathetic system usually is increased when we have physical activity, fight or flight. For both fight or flight, we need to have muscle activity. But generally, we also need to have greater blood pressure, greater blood supply to organs. So it's necessary to stimulate the key organ, heart. And heart's um, has high activity, as you remember. Heart is greatly stimulated by sympathetic system. So, for higher work performing, heart needs, needs greater blood supply. And this is arranged by beta-2 receptors predominance in the heart coronary vessels. Similarly, skeletal muscles, they work more. This is physical activity. Person are running from the danger or fighting danger. So, and 
It's necessary to provide better blood supply for skeletal muscles, and it's arranged also by dilation of vessels. But we cannot dilate all the vessels of the body and give higher blood supply to all organs. We cannot do it. Also, we cannot make less blood supply to brain, because regardless of type of activity, brain is highly active always, and blood supply to brain should not be decreased. But we cannot give every organ higher blood supply and not touch the brain even. It's necessary to take some more blood. And when we perform physical activity, what is not much uh, important? The digestive processes. We can decrease them. We can inhibit temporarily. And with decreased activity of the digestive organs, of course, we can decrease both secretion and blood supply. And so it's all done by all is done by <coughs> sympathetic system activation. And also, there is great surface area of the skin. And if skin blood supply becomes decreased, so you can understand, we can take a lot of blood and bring to skeletal muscles and to the heart. So all this is a basis for redistribution of blood supply. Digestive organs, which is large area of the supply, and skin vessels become constricted. And so this is the basis how we can give more blood to both heart and skeletal muscles. Then let's consider the digestive processes, secretion of juices. I hope you understood general idea that stimulation of digestion is the function of the parasympathetic system, while a sympathetic system stimulates all the rest systems except for digestive. <coughs> And here in parasympathetic effects, let's begin. Stimulation of all the secretion, all secretory processes in digestive tract, beginning from the upper until the last portion. And receptors mostly are muscarinic 3 cholinergic receptors and second messengers are IP3. Salivary glands, secretion of saliva. The stomach, which produces the gastric juice, the pancreas, the effect of stimulation of pancreatic juice secretion. The liver produces more bile and intestine produces more intestinal juice. All this happens due to parasympathetic stimulation. Rest and digest. And digestive processes, of course, require secretion of juices. Sympathetic system increases the activity of the central nervous system, cardiovascular, respiratory, but suppresses processes in digestive system. And there is inhibition of secretion through alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. And just remember one exclusion, that not fully it corresponds to saliva. Not a full inhibition, but just secretion of small amount of very thick saliva, but not total inhibition. So there is one case when there is no fully opposite effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The rest are clearly opposite. Suppression of gastric secretion, of pancreatic, bile, intestinal, all these is performed by sympathetic system. Smooth muscles, which in consider the peristalsis, movements of the mm, gastrointestinal tract, so the propulsion, propulsion of the content, mixing, propulsion, and so on. Parasympathetic system, which is the main stimulator of digestive processes, produces an effect of stimulation of peristalsis. But Smooth muscles of gastrointestinal tract are present in the walls of organs, which contributes to mixing and, and propulsion, but also there are sphincters that divide uh, separate parts of the digestive tract. And for propulsive movement, the sphincters must be open. So always um, stimulation of the um, contraction of walls of organs should be accompanied by relaxation of sphincters and vice versa. So parasympathetic effects in the walls of organs should be contraction, so it increases motor activity of the small muscles in the intestine. And for stimulation of contraction, M3 cholinergic receptors are used as usual. But for sphincters, which must be open to provide uh, movement from one part of the digestive tract to the next, we should relax these sphincters, and relaxation through M3 receptors cannot be achieved. And here we use M2 cholinergic receptors that provide perhaps by the, um, provide relaxation by hyperpolarization due to higher potassium permeability. Then 
Now, sympathetic effect, which should be entirely opposite. In the walls of organs, there should be relaxation. Temporarily, we stop um, digestive processes, we decrease secretion of digestive juices, and the only thing that should be contacted and should be stimulated this is sphincters. Because if uh, processing in one part is not finished yet, it's necessary to prevent further movement of this part of uh, content which is not processed enough. So, in the walls of organs, there will be relaxation. And relaxation is usually achieved through beta-2 adrenergic receptors, you recall. And in the vessels where we have dilation, the receptors, these receptors are present. In bronchial wall, where we have dilation, sympathetic effect, also these receptors. And here in the wall of organs, similarly. Then second messenger is usual for all beta receptors, cyclic A and B. And also, we also may participate in the subtype alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Decreased release of acetylcholine mechanism. And sphincters. As for sphincters, we should contract them. And contraction is achieved by alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, which operate as usual through phospholipase C pathway and production of second messengers IP3 and diacylglycerol. Smooth muscles of urinary bladder. Maybe it looks at first not easy to memorize, but actually, <coughs> Actually, it's not very easy, it's logical. The urinary bladder contains practically two muscles. The main muscle which uh, surrounds the whole bladder is the detrusor, which uh, is designed for emptying. This muscle contraction produces higher pressure inside and moves the fluid out. But also there is a sphincter, internal sphincter, which is the smooth muscle sphincter. As well, we have external sphincter with the straight, it's a, a voluntary controlled center, but now we observe only smooth muscles. And effect should be always opposite, you understand that? If the um, contraction occurs for the trouser, the sphincter should be open. There is no need to, to contract without uh, open opening. And oppositely, if we, we need to prevent release of flu fluid from the bladder, it's necessary to contract sphincter and relax the trouser. And effects of two systems are op opposite for both muscles. Just, it's easy that at rest, it's much more convenient to remove the content of urinary bladder. And during fight or flight, it will be greatly inconvenient. Therefore, contraction of the detrusor should be stimulated by parasympathetic nerves. So, parasympathetic innervation from S3 segment goes and musculus, musculus detrusor should be contracted, as usual through M3 cholinergic receptors that contribute to smooth muscle contraction. And musculus sphincter, correspondingly, should be relaxed to provide the exit of fluid from the urinary bladder. Relaxation requires something different from M3, so M2 cholinergic receptors that increase permeability for potassium and hypopolarize the cells. Sympathetic effect should be entirely opposite. Sympathetic innervation comes to the trouser and produces relaxation. As usual, relaxation of smooth muscles is achieved through activation of beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Cyclic AMP participates. And for sphincter, as usual again, smooth muscle contraction requires alpha-1 adrenergic receptors through <coughs> IP3 pathway. So effects are opposite and it's not a problem to memorize, I hope. Then, actually the effects which are opposite and uh, which where innervation is double are finished. Now we come to purely sympathetic effects which are not opposed by effects from parasympathetic system. This is first for sweat glands. Sweat glands do not have parasympathetic innervation. Only sympathetic nerves. But it's not easy because there are two types of uh, sweat glands and they have difference in the innervation. But fortunately, both in both cases, effect is stimulation of secretion. What's the difference? Maybe you remember from histology, from anatomy. There are thermoregulatory glands which are everywhere almost in the skin of the body. And also we have the other stress glands. For thermoregulatory sweat glands, 
effect of sympathetic system is a stimulation of secretion. But this effect is achieved through some exclusion, because look, receptors are M3 cholinergic receptors. As you can see, it's not due to classical norepinephrine release, because norepinephrine cannot stimulate cholinergic receptors. The, if receptors are cholinergic, it means that transmitter was acetylcholine. And here again, thermoregulatory sweat glands are innervated by sympathetic fibers, but these sympathetic fibers are cholinergic. This is second exclusion. First exclusion was for innervation of the vessels in the skeletal muscles. Some vessels in the skeletal muscles are innervated by sympathetic cholinergic fibers. And now again, thermoregulatory sweat glands are innervated by sympathetic cholinergic fibers. Messengers are AP3 and they are so visceral as usual. And stimulation is uh, sweat um, production is the classical effect for this thermoregulatory sweat glands. And sweating itself is not enough, but if sweat becomes vaporized, evaporated from the surface, it brings decrease of um, heat. Because evaporation requires the energy, requires heat to produce. And therefore, heat loss occurs each time when sweat is evaporated from the surface of skin. But also, we have another type of glands, stress or epocrine sweat glands. These glands are located mostly on the palm skin and feet skin. And here, receptors are alpha-1 adrenergic receptors that produce through the same second messengers stimulation of secretion. But here, the transmitter is classical sympathetic, nor epinephrine. So, again, there are no parasympathetic innervation in sweat glands. Simply must be memorized. Then, sympathetic metabolic effects. The parasympathetic system does not have pure metabolic effects. Of course, usually, activation of parasympathetic system when uh, is accompanied by active digestion, where glucose, among others, are the substances is absorbed and stimulates insulin secretion. So there are a number of effects that occur simultaneously, but they are not activated by parasympathetic system itself. But sympathetic system can produce own metabolic effects because receptors for noradrenaline are present in few organs additionally. In liver, there is uh, also there are receptors for norepinephrine and adrenaline, both in noradrenaline, and receptors they stimulate process of glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis, also even gluconeogenesis, is stimulated, and all this goes through beta adrenergic receptors. And you see, as a result, glycogen is split and into glucose, and glucose is released. So, sympathetic system metabolic effect one is glycogenolysis with resulting increase in glucose level, blood glucose level. And also, the receptors for sympathetic transmitter and for catecholamines both are present in fat tissue or adipose tissue. And here, this effect is lipolysis. Lipids are split into, triacylglycerols are split into fatty acids. So, effects also achieved through beta 2 and beta 3 receptors. But if you remember that through beta, I hope maybe it's not. So, and as a result, we have an increase in the free fatty acids. So, if we recall the general purpose of sympathetic activity is fight or flight and it needs high amount of energy, high amount of energy can be achieved when nutritional factors are available for energy production and main substances that we use for energy production are these substances, glucose and free fatty acids. Just glucose is more cheap source that gives a lot of ATP without great amount of oxygen spent, but free fatty acids require more oxygen, but they give much more ATP molecules. So both types of um, substrates for production of energy are available when sympathetic system produces its metabolic effects. Receptors, again, simply beta receptors with second messenger C, A and P. Then central sympathetic effects. It's clear that we cannot um, um, go without any stimulation of the central nervous system because for both fight 
and flight, we should take everything into account. We should consider a lot of information. So we should get more information than usual per time unit. We should be able to process this information much faster because sometimes the survival depends on how quickly and how correctly the decision was made. So for all of this, it's necessary to increase excitability. And it's not only a higher force of muscles contraction. Before muscles contraction, it's necessary to decide which muscles and which direction of movement. So central effects, higher efferent input from receptors. It can be said in different words, higher sensitivity of analyzers. It's also continued. So analyzers send more information and brain is able to take this information into consideration faster than usual because excitability of neurons is increased. And inhibition of pain and hunger. It's also important because if pain and hunger will produce their usual action, it greatly suppresses the ability to make decisions to consider everything because pain usually is not a contributing factor and hunger also. So central sympathetic effect is inhibition of pain and hunger. And it's well known that people may forget about hunger when they are stimulated by some important something important, some worries, some troubles. And pain is well known about cases when with great severe wounds the soldiers during war could continue fighting in the war actions without shock, which inevitably should develop in such case of trauma when it's not uh, such a situation uh, in war, when adrenaline is high and sympathetic system is highly active. And just after ending of these actions, a person may finally become in a state of shock because of this pain, but before pain was not influencing for the body because of strong inhibition of both pain and hunger by sympathetic system. So, and now we've finished to consider the most important effects of the system, both divisions of the autonomic system. Now, the one thing remains, just to remind you, which part of the brain is the high autonomic center. And this was something that studied in previous topic. And I'm sure that everyone remembers that this is the hypothalamus. And hypothalamus. Pictures just for to remind you that hypothalamus is a very little structure containing numerous, numerous nuclei, and including the division into posterior and anterior nuclei. Anterior nuclei stimulate the parasympathetic part of the autonomic system, and posterior nuclei stimulate the sympathetic effects. And it's uh, proven by stimulation by electrodes of, the, for example, posterior nuclei, and it results in elevation of blood pressure, stimulation of the heart, inhibition of digestion, and so on. So classically, all these effects are controlled from above, from the high autonomic center, which is hypothalamus. Of course, cortex influences the autonomic functions. It's clear our mood, our thoughts easily bring changes and the emotional part of this uh, change of emotional estimation comes from limbic system to its effector hypothalamus. So finally, the highest area which influences the autonomic functions, of course, is the brain cortex. But generally, and due to autonomic functioning of all this, hypothalamus is the high autonomic center. And centers in the midbrain, hindbrain, spinal cord are considered to be lower autonomic center. But they are still the centers within the central nervous system. And additionally, we may have ganglia located uh, nearby the spinal cord or inside the organs, and they are very low centers. And that's the end of lecture. Thank you for your attention. I believe that it's possible to study once and forever this system, which will be very useful for your further study in other disciplines and even in normal physiology second uh, term. And also it provides great base for pharmacology because this is a big part of pharmacology that considers the opportunity to influence many functions of internal organs through stimulation of the same receptors that are used by autonomic transmitters. For example, when we need to dilate bronchi, we can stimulate beta-2 receptors in the bronchial wall and there are many drugs that can produce this and some are more, more selective in the stimulation, not all beta receptors, but only 
predominantly beta-2 receptors. And some drugs can inhibit uh, receptors so that we can provide corresponding effect by inhibition of effect of sympathetic system. And the better you know now these receptors, the easier will be pharmacology study. And you understand that pharmacology is final effector of the medical practice. What you can do to the patient using their um, treatment with different drugs. So thank you for attention. Please study as much as you can because it's included. Many questions from this topic are included into your end of term test. Many questions are included into examination test. So the more you know this, the easier will become both tests.